This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. For a variety of reasons, I've uh, always tried to keep tabs on what is happening in uh, Chile. Uh, And the reason in part was because uh, Chile was one of the big uh, initiators of the neoliberal turn back in 1973 when Pinochet dislodged uh, Salvador Allende, the democratically elected government, uh, in a military coup and installed the Chicago boys who created the neoliberal turn in uh, Chilean politics. So I was intrigued uh, in the beginning of October when there was a piece in the Financial Times, which is an interview with uh, President Pinera, who's a businessman, a right uh, uh, conservative kind of figure, who uh, was uh, very, very content with uh, the conditions in Chile. And he uh, so sort of depicted Chile as an oasis in Latin America uh, of sound growth, of uh, strong development, and uh, uh, all good economic indicators. So he seemed to be saying that uh, Chile was in very good shape. About three weeks after I read that, suddenly I get the news that there's been serious uh, uprising going on in Chile, and uh, after a few days, it became even more serious, and millions of people are on the streets. Uh, the initial problem was uh, an increase in subway fares. And in Chile, there's been a tradition since uh, 2006 or so that very often students, uh, high school students, uh, can begin uh, movements, and that is what happened. Uh, Piñera didn't like it and said, well, okay, we're going to have to curb the lawlessness, which was an invitation to the police to go out and uh, start to uh, quell uh, the discontent. Uh, But the only effect of that was to bring out more people. Uh, Some subway stops were burned down. Three churches were burned down. Uh, So suddenly there is this huge uh, eruption and it goes on for some considerable time, and Pinera suddenly started had to say, well, he needed to listen, they had to do something new. Uh, there was some a huge million march of people, a peaceful march, uh, in effect uh, demanding that there be a new constitution, because the constitution in Chile is one that was drawn up under Pinochet. It's a neoliberal constitution. It mandates that all the pension systems shall be privatized, that health and education shall be privatized. So uh, that was uh, eventually agreed upon. Now, this event in Chile was, uh, was, was not isolated because shortly before this, something rather analogous had happened in Ecuador. Uh, the IMF had stepped in and uh, mandated uh, structural adjustment in Ecuador, and uh, the result of that was uh, uh, the usual kind of imposition of new taxes, but in particular, again, like in Chile, uh, a transport issue came up because uh, gas prices in Ecuador are subsidized, and uh, the IMF said the subsidy should be dropped, and so the government agreed to do that. Uh, This immediately caused distress amongst the mass of the population, and so we find uh, the population starts to protest. Uh, Indigenous populations had already uh, been in motion, and uh, there was a great sort of march upon uh, Quito, the capital city, Uh, And it became so strong and so fearful that the government uh, got out of Quito and went off to the coastal city of Guayaquil because uh, they felt rather exposed in Quito. And so there was, a, if you like, a a similar kind of mass movement which erupted in uh, Ecuador, which resulted in the end of the the president of uh, Ecuador, whose uh, 
name is Lenin, by the way, which is always uh, amuses me somewhat. So uh, Lenin uh, had to agree that he was going to drop uh, a lot of the proposals taken from the IMF, and he would uh, uh, start to negotiate. So you have uh, Chile and Ecuador in turmoil. At the same time, in a rather different direction, you had a turmoil in Bolivia. Uh, and uh, there had been an election, there was a widespread suspicion that uh, Moreno, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the president, had uh, uh, not really got as many votes as he said he had got. And uh, what we saw was uh, a, a kind of, in a sense, a right-wing uh, mass demonstration. And uh, uh, the president and his government uh, actually had to flee the country and ask for asylum in Mexico, uh, which they were granted. And so again, mass movements on the streets, uh, conflicting groups clashing with each other. So Bolivia is in turmoil, uh, Chile is in turmoil, Ecuador is in turmoil. And then suddenly you notice that across the other side of the world, in Lebanon, Lebanon is also in turmoil, that uh, suddenly people are taking to the streets. There's a mass movement of a protest against the government. Uh, in this one, it was fairly peaceful, but there were some uh, casualties. Uh, but at the same time, the same thing is going on in Baghdad, uh, in Iraq. And, and uh, in this one, uh, there were two or three hundred people that were uh, killed. Uh, in mass demonstrations, which were mainly coming out of the low-income, impoverished areas of Baghdad, that basically were complaining they had been left behind. And the next thing we know is something analogous is also going on in Tehran. And then you look at it and you kind of say, well, this is, this is a lot of turmoil going on. And you come back and you look at France and the uh, Gilets Jaunes, protests have been going on for a whole year and they suddenly connect uh, to a whole set of pro protests against the government and essentially Paris and the major cities in France are all closed down in a mass protest. And suddenly you get the sense uh, that uh, there is something going on in the world. Uh, I sometimes fantasize, let's suppose uh, I was in a spaceship way above Earth and all those places on planet Earth where there were eruptions going on uh, sort of flashed and what you would see is, is, is a world in turmoil. They're pretty much everywhere. There are mass protests. Some of them are labor related. In the United States, for example, we've had a whole wave of uh, teacher strikes uh, over the years and culminating in in Chicago again back in September. Uh, there have been some major strikes uh, occurring in uh, Bangladesh and also some major uh, movements of this kind even occurring in, in, in China. So you look at the situation and you say, well, there's something going on here which suggests that globally uh, what we're seeing are some mass protests of various kinds. And what is it that all these protests are about? Do they have anything in common? In each instance, you would say, uh, okay, there's particular kind of concerns, but the common thread in all of this is that it seems that in many parts of the world, there has been a realization that the dominant economic model uh, to which we appeal in terms of uh, getting our daily bread and getting our daily supplies and, and, and getting employment and all the rest of it, that model is not working. And it's not working for the mass of the people. It may be working for the top 1% or those top 2, 10%, but it's not working for the mass of the people. And the mass of the people are becoming aware of that and they're taking to the streets and protesting and saying this model is not satisfying to us. And the situation has nearly always been, as in Chile, that the top 1% in Chile controls about 33% of the wealth. Uh, the same problem arises in other parts of the world, uh, that there is mass inequality, and therefore it is not only the lower classes, but the middle classes who are suffering a great deal uh, in terms of uh, the economy uh, not working well.
So what is it about the economy that is not working? Uh, in two or three of the cases, uh, in fact, in Tehran, in Ecuador, and in Chile, uh, there was a similarity, and it was the, the trigger for the whole uprising. Were, the trigger was uh, the uh, increase in fuel prices and the increasing costs of transportation. Now, having mobility in a, in a city is a terribly important uh, attribute. Uh, for most, most people, getting around in the city is, is critical, and the cost of getting around is critical. And if the cost becomes prohibitive, then low-income populations in particular are very hard hit uh, by any increase in transport costs or any increase in fuel costs. So that there is a trigger, but then the interesting thing is how the trigger moves into something else. And so what we start to see is protests which are based very much on, on food prices, on transport cost prices, on, in some instances, also lack of access to urban services and uh, to adequate uh, affordable housing, those sorts of issues. Uh, come into the situ in, in, into the scene. So there you have uh, a, a kind of a base, an economic basis. And there are two ways in which you can think about this economic basis. The first is to say this is a problem of the particular form of capital accumulation, the particular form of capitalism, which we generally refer to as neoliberalism that the problem is not capitalism, but the neoliberal form of capitalism. And there's been some agreement, even in the corporate sectors and so on, that this may indeed uh, be part of our contemporary problem. Uh, a business round table, a uh, group of uh, corporate heads got together and said, look, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, we have been far too much concerned with just merely questions of efficiency and profitability, and that we should really be concerned about the social impact of what we're doing, uh, the social consequences of what we're doing, which is a way of saying that the neoliberal model has brought us this far, but we've had enough of the neoliberal model, we ought to go to a broader-based uh, version uh, of what capital accumulation is all about, and we have uh, a uh, sort of movement uh, which is beginning to be expressed of saying we need a more socially responsible form of capitalism. We need indeed even a more equitable form of capitalism because one of the questions which uh, lies behind this, nearly all of these protests is the uh, increasing social inequality almost everywhere in the world and the recognition that, so that, that social inequality has, has gone too far. So there is an argument that kind of says the neoliberal form of capital is the problem. And in Chile that is very explicit because to the degree that the protests and the violence uh, climbed down, it was because the president and the Congress got together and collectively decided they would have a um, referendum uh, plebiscite uh, next April on the question of whether or not they would want to have uh, a new constitution. Uh, and the new constitution would address the, f the, the, the fundamental uh, neoliberal uh, qualities of that constitution, which mandates that all, all pensions shall be private, that health and education shall be private, uh, and that uh, the market system should, should, should uh, be the basis uh, of the social relations and economic development uh, in, in the country. So there is, there is uh, that way of looking at things. I don't share that view. I think, uh, yeah, there's some acute problems with the neoliberal form of capitalism, but there are certain parts of the world where you don't really have strong neoliberal capitalism, and you've still got uh, the, the, the judgment that the economic system, uh, the economic model is not working, and that economic model uh, is uh, uh, that of capitalism. So uh, I would make the argument that there is, in fact, a really very serious uh, kind of question. And we're now becoming aware of that 
of that. We've become conscious of it. And there are a number of things about these protest movements uh, which I think I, I, it will be important to note. The first is that they're not new. There's been, over the last uh, 30 years, a growing set of uh, protest movements which have been ar arising, which are not purely labour-centred. In fact, many of them have been centred around the question of the quality of urban life, the quality of daily life, uh, and the defects which uh, exist in terms of delivery of public services, delivery of qualities of uh, uh, life which are uh, adequate uh, for the population in general. For example, in 2013, uh, in Turkey, uh, there was uh, an uprising around uh, Gezi Park. Now, Gezi Park is simply a park in the centre of Istanbul which the, the government decided they were going to sort of turn into, uh, a, 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 if you like, a big shopping mall, and, 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 and people kind of uh, got angry about that. Then the usual thing happened. Uh, there was overreaction by the police. The police started to become very violent. Uh, the police violence actually brought out lots of people, and before you knew it, uh, there were protests emerging, not only in Istanbul, but in all the other major uh, cities. In, uh, in Turkey, and this created uh, then a, a, a major protest, uh, which I think that uh, was, was, was nationwide. The same thing happened a few weeks later in Brazil. Uh, again, a transport issue sparked a problem in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Uh, the police came out and started to beat up uh, people, and people came out to protest against the police, and pretty soon uh, you find in almost every city in Brazil, about 100-odd cities in Brazil, there are major protest movements, mass movements, uh, protesting not simply about transport, but protesting about, at that time, all of the money that was being spent on building new stadiums and building new infrastructures for the World Cup and the Olympic Games. Uh, now, it's not as if in Brazil people don't appreciate uh, soccer, I mean, but what they don't appreciate is the fact that new stadiums were being built, uh, usually by very corrupt uh, financial and developer interests, and a lot of money was being spent on, on, on these infrastructures uh, when there was no money uh, for hospitals and schools and all the other things that really needed to be there. So there has been a long history now of, of mass mobilizations. And the mass mobilizations uh, generally uh, don't last that long. Most of the mobilizations occur, then they quieten down, and people forget about them, and then they erupt again. So what we've seen is a period of the last 30 years of uh, mass mobilizations occurring again and again and again. Uh, in a sense, it maybe it started back in with the anti-globalization movement when the WTO uh, meetings in Seattle were disrupted. Suddenly all kinds of people descended upon Seattle and protested and the, and the delegates to the WTO conference couldn't get, to the, uh, get, get there anymore. And then after that, there was a whole period when every uh, G20 or G8 uh, or IMF or World Bank meeting was picketed by a large number of protesters and then came uh, Occupy Wall Street and, you know, all of those kinds. So, so we've, 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 we've seen uh, again and again mass movements of, of these various kinds. But they have not actually persisted. And the other thing that has been very uh, characteristic of them is that they've often been very fragmented, that different groups participate in these mass mobilizations but don't actually coordinate together. Now, one of the things that was very important about uh, Lebanon in, in most recent times is that in Lebanon there's been a whole history of conflict and civil war, uh, which is largely around religious uh, factions and religious groups and, and all the rest of it. For the first time in many, many years in Lebanon, uh, all of the factions came together and, te and started to protest against the kleptocratic, uh, autocratic, 
uh, oligarchical form of governance that was existing there. In other words, uh, everybody was agreed, uh, no matter what their religious faction, that the economic model was not working and that there needed to be something uh, radically different and that, that something different had to be worked out between the different uh, religious factions and the d different different religious factions were uh, talking together. Now I've had a similar experience of this sort in uh, in Brazil after Bolsonaro got elected, and uh, that of course is a very uh, right wing um, and uh, evangelical Christian government. Uh, there are in in Brazil several left parties. I mean, of course, there is the Workers' Party, which is the big one, but then there are several fragmented parties along. Now, each political party has its own think tank, uh, which is supported by uh, government. If you have representation in Parliament, you get some money uh, to 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 set up a, a think tank, which is going to do policy research. And there are six uh, political parties of the left. Uh, and they have, generally speaking, not been in good communication with each other. In fact, they've been pretty angry at each other. But this time, uh, when I arrived there, all six parties had collectively got together and staged a week-long uh, reflection, really, on, on the political situation, and that and therefore all came together. And at the end of the week, uh, when I was sort of participating in this, uh, there was one sort of mass rally in which all of the political leaders came together, all of them gave talks uh, together, all of them hugged each other on the stage, and so suddenly the left is all together in a way which has not been uh, there before. The same, actually, I gather, is, uh, is the case in Chile. Uh, different left factions have uh, actually got together and started to talk with each other about the, the, the whole kind of prospect of, of uh, creating a new uh, constitution. So. Uh, maybe something is different this time, and which is that all of these mobilizations uh, have the potentiality uh, to start to have some staying power because uh, they start to get institutionalized and organized. See, there's a big difference between mobilization and organization. And I think what we've seen is a great capacity to mobilize with the Women's March or whatever, uh, the uh, immigrant uh, rights uh, marches and so on. So there's a lot of mobilization going on, but long time organization seems, not, seems to be lacking. And what we now see is the, perhaps the beginnings of the signs in all of these cases of the coming together of all of those people who feel that there is something wrong with the basic economic model and the basic economic model has to be changed uh, in such a way as to provide uh, health and well-being and good education and good pension rights and all the rest of it uh, to the mass of the population rather than develop, delivering strong economic growth and strong economic benefits for the top 1% or the top uh, uh, 10%. So this is then the, 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 the issue. And I've been trying to think very much uh, about, uh, is there a central contradiction in the way in which capital is working these days, which really requires to be addressed? And if so, what would that central contradiction be? Well, uh, an obvious uh, serious problem is level of social inequality. Uh, almost every country uh, in the world has ex experienced an increase of social inequality over the last 30 years. And uh, it has gone so far that I think a lot of people feel it has gone uh, too far and that therefore there has to be some sort of movement to try to recapture uh, a much greater level of equality in society, that better goods and services have to be delivered uh, to the mass of the population. So that is one question. The second question is not social inequality, but it is uh, the problem of uh, climate change. Uh, we know that uh, climate change uh, has reached a point where there has to be some sort of collective response. And uh, the, the urgency of this uh, from reports, but also from data, uh, I think is becoming clearer to more and more people uh, around the world. Uh, for example, uh, I was checking the other day a graph uh, 
uh, of uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, here in the United States has produced a, a graph of, uh, of, of carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. Uh, how they get that, I'm not quite sure, but you can get back in the rocks and see what the carbon levels uh, were from, from the rock uh, uh, geological record. So it's not been more than 300 parts per million over the last 800,000 years uh, until around 1960 when it broke through the 300 parts per million. It's now at 400 parts per million, which says basically the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere have not been seen at this level over the last 800,000 years and we've really got to go back to the times of the dinosaurs and all the rest of it uh, to put ourselves in a climate situation of, uh, of uh, the sort that we're, we've now uh, got, now is predicated by uh, this high level of carbon concentrations. Uh, these levels of carbon concentrations, by the way, will not easily dissipate and even if there are zero emissions from now on, uh, the levels of carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are enough to do serious damage to the world's, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the Greenland ice pack, uh, the, the, the uh, Arctic ice, uh, the, the Himalaya snowpack, all of that will, will disappear even if there are no more uh, carbon emissions and, and it will disappear unless something major is done about carbon extraction from uh, uh, the atmosphere. So uh, there are environmental questions, there's social inequality, there's environmental questions. And uh, at the same time there are also other reasons why one can start to say that uh, the kind of form of capital that exists right now uh, is uh, unreasonable, uh, it is actually barbaric and that needs therefore to, to, to be uh, replaced by, by another economic order in exactly the same way that Marx is outraged by the kinds of factory conditions of, in, that he was witnessing or at least he was being told about or learning about in Britain. Uh, so we can look at the factory conditions in Bangladesh or in China and everywhere and kind of say, look, the, this is no way in which a civilized uh, world should organize its uh, production. So there are these, 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 these things, but I think there is an additional factor right now, one which Marx did not actually have to deal with, but which I think is very critical uh, for, for, for us right now. Uh, we have a situation where uh, capital is always about growth. Uh, it has to be about growth because it's always about the pursuit of profit, and a healthy capitalist economy is one where everybody has positive profits, which means that there's more value at the end of the day than there was at the beginning, and that more value at the end of the day uh, is then used to create even more value. So the capitalist growth, uh, and I've had occasion to point this out in, in, in former podcasts, capitalist growth is about compound growth. And compound growth uh, is uh, itself right now becoming the problem. Uh, the size of the global economy doubles about every 25 years. Now, uh, in Marx's time, the doubling of the size of the economy in 25 years really didn't pose a problem. Uh, but it's beginning to pose uh, that kind of problem where we need to go from $4 trillion economy that existed in 1950 to a $40 trillion economy uh, as of uh, the year 2000, uh, to an $80 trillion uh, economy, uh, we're coming close to that right now, which is then going to be a $160 trillion economy by 2050, which is going to be a 320 by 2075 and a 640 at the end of the century. So the doubling of the rate is become, going to become a very, very serious problem. And this is what compound interest does. And Marx is very fond of, create, of quoting from something that was written by a man called Richard Price back in 1772, who wrote a tract about compounding interest. And what, what, what Price did was to say this, that if you invested one penny uh, on the date of uh, uh, the 
birth of Jesus Christ. And it uh, grew at a 5% compound rate. By the time you get to 1772, you would need 150 spheres the size of planet Earth, all solid gold, to give you the, the enough money equivalent of, of what that penny had become under compounding at 5% uh, a year since uh, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. If, however, you only charge simple interest, that is, not you didn't compound the interest, uh, by the time you get to 1772, the total amount you would need, he count, counted, was one penny would, would have become something like uh, seven pounds, uh, 20 shillings, and something or other. Compounding growth is something which cannot be sustained. We are at that point where compounding growth has started to actually accumulate at such a rate that it's become a global kind of problem. And the, the, the capitalist economy right now is having real difficulties of satisfying the requirement of profitable investment opportunities for $40 trillion as, as of 2000, $80 trillion uh, around now, and where is it going to be invested in and how is it going to be invested? That is the real, real problem we're looking at. Now, this is uh, a critical, critical problem. Uh, and there are various things that are happening in the economy because, as Marx points out, there's only one kind of capital that can accumulate without limit. And that kind of capital is, in fact, money capital, uh, provided that money is just simply about numbers. Now, when money was constrained by gold, uh, it couldn't accumulate infinitely uh, because there's only a finite amount of gold and that finite amount. So, but in 1971, we got off the gold standard. Uh, the money supply of the world was liberated from any restraints of, of, of any contact with gold. And so we get uh, this tremendous kind of growth in the money supply since 1970 or so. Uh, because the money supply is simply whatever the central banks of the world decide it's going to be, with the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, being, being critical uh, in this because uh, most transactions in the world uh, occur uh, on, uh, on their dollar contracts, and so the dollar is the reserve currency, and when we get into difficulties, the, the, the Federal Reserve simply prints more money, uh, and we see this uh, compounding of the, the quantity of the money in circulation. Uh, but then the question is, what is that money going to do? And how is it going to actually earn a profit? And we've seen all sorts of adjustments in the global economy uh, to, to, to deal with that problem. But there is uh, what Marx called a realization problem of how on earth can you reinvest uh, all of this money in such a way that it, it creates more profit uh, and, and, and where is that profit going to come from? Um, so that is, if you like, uh, one, one half of the problem. But the other part of the problem is this, that in Marx's time, if there was a sudden collapse of capitalism, most people in the world would be able to feed themselves and reproduce because most people were self-sufficient in their local area with the kinds of, you know, uh, things they needed uh, to live on. Uh, in other words, uh, people could put breakfast on their table irrespective of uh, what was going on in the global economy. Uh, right now, that's no longer the case. We, most people in, in the United States, but increasingly, of course, in Europe and in Japan, and now increasingly in China and India and Indonesia and everywhere, are dependent entirely upon the delivery of food uh, to them so that they get the food uh, from uh, the circulation of capital. Uh, in Marx's time, like I say, that would have not been true, uh, but now this is a situation where probably around 70 or maybe 80 percent of the world's people uh, are dependent upon uh, the circulation of capital uh, in order to assure their food supply, in order to deliver them uh, the, the kinds of uh, fuels which are going to allow them mobility, uh, going to actually uh, deliver them all the necessities uh, to be able to reproduce uh, their daily life.
So this is a this is a I think a, a, a situation which I can really summarize in the following kind of way: that uh, capital right now is too big to fail. We cannot imagine a situation where we would shut down the flow of capital because if we shut down the flow of capital, eighty percent of the world's population would immediately starve, would be rendered immobile. Uh, would not be able to, 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 to reproduce themselves in very effective ways. So we cannot afford uh, any kind of sustained attack upon capital accumulation. So the kind of fantasy that you might have had, or uh, socialists or communists and so on might have had uh, back in uh, 1850, which is that, well, okay, we can destroy this capitalist system and we can build something entirely different. That is an impossibility right now. We have to keep the circulation of capital in, in motion. We have to keep things moving, because if we don't do that, uh, we are actually stuck uh, with a situation in which, like as I've said, almost all of us uh, would 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 starve. And uh, this is a this means that like that capital in general is is too big to fail. It, it is too dominant. It is too necessary to us that we cannot allow it to fail. We have to actually uh, spend some time propping it up, trying to reorganize it and, and, and maybe shift it around very slowly and over time uh, to a different configuration. But a revolutionary overthrow of this capitalist uh, economic system uh, is not anything that's conceivable at the present time. It will not happen and it cannot happen and we have to make sure that it does not happen. But at the same time, the other side of the coin is Capital is too big, too monstrous, too uh, uh, huge to survive, that it cannot survive in its current form. So on the one hand, we can't do without it. On the other hand, it is on a suicidal path. Uh, so this is, if you like, what, the, what I think the central dilemma is. So that there are numerable contradictions in, in a capitalist system right now. One of the big contradictions, as I've mentioned, is, is an incredible class and social inequality. Uh, the second is, is the, the environmental uh, ag aggregates. Uh, but then uh, comes the kind of question of this too big to fail uh, too monstrous to survive contradiction. And I think that that is the major contradiction that we should be addressing. And therefore, a socialist program uh, or an anti-capitalist program uh, of the sort that I would want is one about uh, trying to manage this capitalist system in such a way that we stop it being uh, too monstrous uh, uh, to survive at the same time as we uh, organize uh, the capitalist system so that it becomes less and less dependent upon profitability and becomes more and more organized so that it delivers uh, the use values to the whole of the world's population so that the world's population can reproduce in peace and tranquility rather than uh, the way it's going right now, which is not peace and tranquility at all, but eruptions. Uh, and these eruptions can, of course, uh, also lead uh, to uh, conflicts between uh, different parts of the world and geopolitical conflicts and, and, and the like. So there it is. I think we need to think about this idea that capital is too big to, is, is, is too big to fail, uh, but at the same time, it is too monstrous to survive. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.